like I said, my name is Margie Shepard. I'm the technology coordinator for the Mid-Continental Region of NNLM. My co-host uh, is Sharon Hahn, NLM Associate Fellow. And for those of you who are new to NNLM, I just want to give you a really short introduction about our organization. So the National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. The National Library of Medicine is one of 27 institutes at NIH. It is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources like Medline Plus and PubMed. NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine and is an outreach program of NLM. The network is made up of eight geographic regions. Eight health sciences libraries function as regional medical libraries for the respective region. The RMLs coordinate the operation of a network of medical libraries and other organizations to carry out regional and national programs such as this. If your institution isn't a member of the network, please consider joining. It's completely free, and once you sign up, you'll receive weekly postings about our resources, trainings, fundings, and more. And the uh, title of today's webinar is Understanding Vaccine Hesitancy and Social Media's Role in Spreading Vaccine Misinformation. This webinar is part of the NNLM Identifying and Combating Health Misinformation Series. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Kalina Kolpai. Uh, Dr. Kolpai studies how groups use socio-technical systems, affects decision-making, and information behavior. She researches information-seeking behaviors, trust assessment of information and misinformation, and decision-making with a focus on when people dissent from the scientific mainstream. She specifically focuses on how social networking sites and digital communities interact with information behavior practices around health and science. Dr. Kolpai received her PhD in Information Studies from the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington. Dr. Kolpai? Wow, that was such a great intro. Thank you <laughs> so much. Um, and I'm so excited uh, to be here today. Um, this is a topic I've thought about for many years, and so I always enjoy talking about it. Um, and I feel like we're going to be talking about this for a very long time. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. And uh, apologies if I tend to talk quickly. I, I do that because I'm very excited, and I try to cram a lot in in a short amount of time. But everyone will have access to the slides, uh, so hopefully that will help. But I'm working on it. All right, so next slide. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, so to give a quick overview of what I'll be covering today, um, I'm going to give an overview on what is even vaccine hesitancy. It's a term you've probably been he hearing. You might think it's the same thing as the anti-vaccine, um, but we'll go about over that. And then we're going to give a bunch of examples of what vaccine misinformation looks like, including their tactics and the kind of narratives you might see. Uh, and then how does social media play a role in this? And then finally, moving forward. So the big million dollar question always asks me is like, what do we do now or how do we combat this? And so we're going to try to cover all of that here today. All right, so next slide. Okay, so uh, one of the big questions I was on everyone's mind, I'm sure people have seen these surveys around of like what percentage of the U.S. Uh, would get vaccinated, um, particularly for the COVID-19 vaccine, if it was available to them today. So while this will vary depending on what surveying you source, um, I took a look just at the most recent ones from December to February. Um, this is including Pew Research Center, um, AP, and the CDC. Uh, and they all kind of come around to around the same thing, which is about a uh, little over around 30% of the U.S., which is about one in three, who are not currently planning um, or probably not going to get the vaccine when it comes available. Uh, and so this is often like a shocking number, I think, because that's, that's a pretty high number. Um, this is a concern because ideally we want as many people to be inoculated as possible to promote herd immunity. We, we want to stop the spread of COVID. We want to get past the pandemic. Um, and while we certainly don't have necessarily a perfect comparative measure uh, prior to the pandemic, this is certainly higher than, say, the number of people who um, are saying opting out of vaccinating their children um, on a like sort of national scale in surveys pre-2020. Uh, so this week it definitely is a wider swath of the population now. Okay, next slide. So 
I know I just shared this image that made <laughs> the movement look very dichotomous, like you're either anti-vax or you're pro-vax, but in reality, this is not really the case. So what I have here um, is something called this vaccine acceptance continuum. And what you might understand is you're pro and anti are sort of these like far quarter squares. On the left, you have someone who refuses all vaccines. This is someone you might kind of consider to be anti-vaccine uh, versus someone all the way on the right, which accepts all vaccines. They're totally ready to be vaccinated. But in reality, it's actually this spectrum. Um, there's a lot more sort of nuance to it, but this is sort of a, a simplistic way of looking at it. Um, and when we, particularly when we talk about both vaccine hesitancy and people who are, say, anti-vaccine. So you can have anyone who is actually vaccinating, since it's accept but unsure, which is like, okay, I guess I'm going to vaccinate, but maybe not super stoked about it. Um, to someone who's like, I don't know, maybe I'll wait and see. They might like pick and choose which childhood vaccines they might delay. When we're talking about COVID, they're like, oh, maybe I'll eventually get it. Maybe I'll wait for other people to get it first. Um, you might have heard that um, yourself among your colleagues. Um, and then there's this refusing but unsure. Or like, mm, I'm not really sure this is the right choice. I may not risk it. You know, maybe I'll, I'll hold off. Like, I don't think maybe COVID's that big a risk. Um, and this is all under the swath of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, so it's not really this sort of, you know, pro and anti. And I think that talks about the, the complicatedness of this uh, the problem. All right, next slide. And so this is a model that you may have seen um, talked about, the three C's of vaccine hesitancy, about convenience, confidence, and complacency. And so right now, I think most of the conversations are really focused on this idea of convenience, particularly when we talk about COVID-19. Is it easy to get the vaccine? Where can I get vaccinated? Uh, you know, who is eligible for the vaccine? How many can we get available? We're all trying to figure out the way. There, right now, the demand for the vaccine is uh, greater than, say, the access to vaccines. And so this is certainly the big issue, but I think this is a problem that we are currently working on. Um, next slide. But in particular, I'm really focusing on these two issues uh, today, which is these issues of confidence and complacency. Confidence being, is it safe to get the vaccine? Um, am I ready? To, like, it's like, do, how much confidence do you have in taking it that you want to be able to get this? And complacency, is it worth getting the vaccine? Is it something that I think is even necessary? You know, it, do I think COVID's a risk? Do I think getting the vaccine is a risk? So as the rollout of vaccines improves and continues, uh, really assuring the public that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe effective and necessary are going to be our biggest hurdles. Right, next slide. And so certainly, you know, <laughs> the anti-vax movement, as we think about, are people being vaccine hesitant and certainly not a new phenomenon. Uh, as long as there's been vaccines, there's been people who've been hesitant to get vaccines. Uh, then really sort of there's been a modern day resurgence um, since uh, 1998 uh, linked to this retracted paper uh, from the Lancet. Uh, you, if you've heard the name Andrew Wakefield, you know which paper I'm talking about, uh, that linked necessary, the MMR vaccine potentially with autism or ASD, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and I find this is a pivotal moment, and Andrew Wakefield's become sort of a major uh, figure within the anti-vax movement. Uh, but in particular, if you look at like leading up to, to where we are today, uh, in 2015, we had this um, another sort of like major growth within the movement. Uh, there was a measles outbreak in California in some of the um, theme parks uh, down like say Disneyland. Uh, and then in response, California decided to remove all exemptions to childhood vaccines with the exception of medical exemptions. Uh, and this was sort of the strongest movement, uh, a policy a way to remove sort of any way of people deciding to opt out of vaccinating. Um, in 2019, the WHO, uh, uh, listed vaccine hesitancy as its top threat to, and its top 10 threats to world health, uh, which is really great foresight. Um, and then in 2019, we saw outbreaks of measles both here in the U.S., like in Washington and in New York, and worldwide. Uh, I think Samoa and the Congo might be some of our big notable cases there. Next slide. Um, now we fast forward to mis uh, vaccine <laughs> misinformation within this COVID area. Uh, one thing that's been particularly interesting for me is that we're basically seeing the same anti-vaccine narratives that are uh, that we've seen over the past two decades being repurposed to be applicable to COVID. So they're taking the sort of the same ideas, the same uh, narratives, the same thoughts, and reusing them to be COVID specific. So, for example, if we're thinking about safety, you might have heard like, "Oh, the MMR vaccine might cause autism." Uh, today, you might be hearing the COVID vaccine might cause miscarriages or might cause like Bell's palsy, um, or about necessity. You say, "Oh, measles isn't that big deal. If you do get it, you're kind of sick a little bit for a week and then you're fine." Um, oh you know, COVID isn't that big a deal, you know, very, very few people die, particularly if you think that you're a young adult, it's like not that big a risk. In addition to this, 
you know, we don't have, particularly somebody who talks about vaccines all the time, you know, when I talk about childhood vaccines, I normally can say, look, look at all the decades and all these research studies that have been done on MMR, uh, DTaP, so forth, and all these childhood vaccines. And we just don't have the same thing with COVID. It's, uh, it's a little telling today is March 1st, and I don't know if anyone's thinking about um, <laughs> where they were already in, like, March 2020, but we're been into the year, and really through the miracle of science that we, that we even have a vaccine available. Uh, and so we just don't have that sort of same level of sort of scientific um, sort of history with the vaccine that we can point to with, with MMR. Um, in addition, you know, we, a lot of people who have otherwise would have considered pro-vaccine in any survey they might have been indicated as pro-vaccine are now this sort of like vaccine hesitant group. Um, and then in a sense, that's a very sort of natural thing. Not, not only is this like a new vaccine, um, but a lot more people are thinking about vaccines. You know, most people didn't really think about it with maybe the exception of the flu shot until they became a parent and they had to decide whether or not they wanted to vaccinate their kid versus today we're really thinking, um, you know, everyone has to make the decision for themselves. All right, next slide. Okay, so um, I really want to talk, uh, before, before I go really dive into um, vaccine misinformation tactics, I want to make sure we have a great terminology here. Uh, there, uh, you might he have heard both misinformation and disinformation, but really these are two separate things. So misinformation is what I would call the uh, incorrect or misleading information um, inadvertently shared to influence public opinion or to obscure the truth. Uh, Inversely, disinformation is something that's often very deliberate. So that's how I remember it. Disinformation is very deliberate. Someone very intentionally doing something um, versus misinformation. So I think we've all shared misinformation at some point. We might have thought something was correct. Uh, we saw something, we're like, oh my gosh, or you know, I'm sharing something and someone misinterprets it. That's all misinformation versus when you think of like deliberate disinformation campaigns, uh, which you know we've often talk about like in the political sphere, but this happens within the anti-vaccine world as well. The difficult thing is that similar to the way that like anti and pro-vax um, are uh, not dichotomous, in the sense that like, you know, mis and disinformation aren't necessarily 100% um, false. It's never like, oh, this is true or this is not true. It's often a lot of this gray area, particularly you talk about things that are misleading or you can use something that is correct, but you like decontextualize it. All right, next slide. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about here is this idea of fabricated content. These are things that are often just completely false. And so I'm going to give a note. So all like the examples I'm giving on the right are things that I would qualify as misinformation. So when you're, um, I've only de-anonymized people who are sort of like um, unknown. So if it's notable, like this person here who is a blue check mark, I did not de-anonymize them. So uh, uh, completely fabricated content is something that you typically think about when you think of conspiratorial content and what we think about like false news or mis or disinformation. This is easy to think. Things are just completely not true. What I have here on the right is someone saying that the new vaccine turns the body into an operating system. It's not true. <laughs> completely false. All right. Uh, next slide. Now we're getting to the trickier stuff. So this idea of manipulated content. This is content that includes, like, can be distortions of both of genuine information or using images. Uh, you might have seen uh, maybe in, in the early pandemic days where people are showing photos of showing how crowded some beaches are, but really this could be manipulated lens work. Depending on the angle you took the picture, it can make it look either people were social distancing or they were not. Um, and then in some cases, like this headline here, this is a recent headline um, that was from a couple weeks ago from NBC News, which is the mainstream media, that initially reported the top headline here, which is 78-year-old woman dies at California vaccination site after being inoculated, a little clickbaity, but in reality, there is no proof in relationship to the link of the vaccine. She had a lot of heart issues and she's had some distress. So she did die at the site, uh, but there's really no evidence of the link. And so they later then updated their headline to better reflect that. Next slide. Um, another thing you might see, and particularly when think about misinformation, is this imposter content. This stuff is particularly egregious um, and typically what we attribute to like bad actors, not to say someone who is uh, unaware about, <laughs> about it. So this is things that are people really impersonating genuine sources or using like established um, uh, branding. So uh, particularly we've seen recently cases of people um, making fake vaccination websites so people can put in all their information or pay money to 
sign up, and these are all scammers. Um, or in cases of like just even coronavirus information, um, you, there's people who are putting out fake um, UNICEF information, people who put out fake CDC information. And these <laughs> can be really damaging, uh, particularly, you know, like if you think about like, oh, okay, here is something I think is from the CDC or from a reputable um, news agency, but it's all completely fake. All right, uh, next slide. All right, so misleading content. This is information that's presented in a misleading way, uh, and this is sometimes some of the trickier stuff to combat because uh, there's something to it that can be true, um, but it's maybe just misconstrued a little bit. So, um, for example, one thing you might see a lot is something that's presented um, comment as fact. So the little bat, the bottom one, this is how bad is coronavirus, most of the numbers. This is actually a, a, an opinion article uh, or commentary, uh, but it's not necessarily something things that are factual. Uh, this is a particularly bad problem when it comes to political misinformation, but it's also happening a lot when it comes to vaccine information. Um, the image I have here on the right, uh, where it's saying here's all the amount of adverse reactions, deaths, and everything as recorded to VAERS, which is the um, vaccine adverse event reporting system. Um, this is, uh, we could talk about this at length about the issues of theirs, but uh, for one, um, adverse reaction we can mean anything. It means like, did you have swelling at the injection site? Were you tired? Adverse reaction means anything that's not normal. It doesn't mean it's severe reaction. Um, also with bears, anyone can support this. Uh, we submit anything. There are things about, um, you know, oh, I got into a car accident after I got vaccinated, or I got hit by lightning. Probably not, but those are all in there as reported as an adverse reaction. Um, these deaths, you know, particularly, this is not a high number. If you think about the millions and millions of people, but also there are things that are not related. So if you go actually look into theirs, you'll see there's someone like they'll put in information there that says there's again no evidence that the death is related. Uh, but you could have, since we were vaccinating particularly a lot with people in nursing homes first, there are people who say have late stage renal failure, but then they got vaccinated and died two weeks later. Was that because of the vaccine or is it because they had late stage renal failure? But it still gets can be put into the system. So we can see how this is like kind of misleading, uh, even though on the surface it looks like, oh my gosh, the vaccine is very unsafe. All right, next slide. Uh, all right, so this is a false context of connection, which is factually accurate content that is shared with a false contextual information. So uh, the image you see on the right um, is something that was shared around a lot in the groups recently, uh, when I say recently, like January, I believe, that said um, from a quote, this is, don't be alarmed if people start dying after taking the vaccine. Um, so, you know, when we think about false context of connection, this is something that could be a headline that doesn't necessarily reflect the content of the article. You might see an old image being reused. This sometimes happens with other crisis events where people say talking about hurricane damage, but they actually are using an old image. Um, and this one, they're actually decontextualizing um, the actual article. So I have actually on the left here, uh, you don't have to necessarily read it, but um, it's actually the full quote of the CNN interview that they were like pulling a bit from where it says you should not be unnecessarily alarmed people are dying. Um, but then if you read the full quote, it says it's something we would expect as a normal occurrence because people die frequently in nursing homes. So if you're vaccinating the elderly, people who are sick, uh, people who are in nursing homes, and you're seeing cases of some people dying, that kind of makes sense. So it shouldn't necessarily be a signal um, immediately that something is wrong with the vaccine. All right. And the last one on next next slide, uh, satire or parody. Uh, I think we've all seen this. People are familiar with The Onion as a famous very parody site. Um, these are often very humorous but and false stories, but uh, they still might unintentionally fool readers. And so uh, these are, this is probably the least threatening out of everything because you could point to it being a parody site really easily, uh, but still something I got to include uh, <laughs> in the deck here. All right, so the next slide. All right. So now I just kind of covered all the different ways that um, information can be misleading, particularly when I think about vaccine misinformation. Now the other thing I want to cover is actually the kind of narratives. So what are the things that are actually being said about the vaccine that are being presented in a misleading way? Right. So uh, the first thing that you're going to see that we're going to be seeing this entire time, we have been seeing, it's the number one thing, <laughs> is a uh, post about a safety. So these are all going to be considered around the safety of the vaccine. Um, and you'll see this in a different number of ways. You'll see, you know, people using data, so like that various data that I mentioned, or even the case of personal stories. So you'll see videos of people recording, like, here's all the injuries or my symptoms that I'm feeling post-vaccine. Um, and this could even include posts that talk about the ingredients of vaccines, um, thimerosal, uh, mercury is one that we often hear about. In particular, we're talking a lot about MR mRNA for this vaccine. Um, but in particular, these, this is going to be the type of narrative you're going to see. Things about, like, this is not safe. 
Um, and so again, and Robert F. Kennedy here, he is also a notable um, anti-vaccine activist that you will we'll see and we'll, might, we'll see a few more posts from him in this deck. Next slide. All right, so you're also going to see posts around necessity and um, efficacy. So when I say necessity, it means like, is this vaccine actually necessary to get? Do I have to get the vaccine? Is COVID that a bigger risk? Uh, versus efficacy is, does the vaccine actually work? So the image I have here on the right is talking about uh, case rates in Canada and Israel comparatively to the vaccination rate. Um, is saying that cases are not necessarily decreasing, um, even though people are getting vaccinated. Um, so this is a thing I think we're going to see more and more as uh, we get uh, to more of the general population. Is it necessary for people to get vaccinated? We just had the uh, Jane, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, you know, has a lower efficacy. So there's a lot of this conversation happening right now that you're going to be seeing. Next slide. All right, so we're also going to be seeing content around the development and distribution of the vaccine. Um, so you might have, uh, one of the things you typically might have heard is something along the lines of like the vaccine is rushed. I don't think it was fully tested, uh, you know, but this can include people like, uh, you know, who can get tested where um, and all that kind of content. Uh, the image you have the side is uh, someone who's saying that it's going to take them a long time to fully trust any rushed vaccine, um, and they have a screenshot of uh, how long it took to eradicate smallpox after a vaccine was developed. Um, 184 years is what they have from the screenshot. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's the right argument to be making, um, and uh, we could talk at length about like why this is actually an incredibly rigorously tested vaccine. Um, but this is something you'll end up seeing and probably have heard a lot yourselves already. Next slide. All right, so uh, you'll also be seeing posts around political and economic motives. Um, these are often revolving around like large figures like Bill Gates, Donald Trump, anyone who's very sort of this notable figure who has some sort of gain, uh, pharmaceutical companies, even um, health organizations like the CDC or WHO. Uh, and these are often, if you're talking about misinformation, where you say like, oh, these are people in power, they're either going to be hiding something or they have some motives or maybe a financial gain. Um, so this is an image here again from Kennedy uh, talking about how uh, critics must be silenced for billionaires to keep from profiting from the pandemic. So, you know, they're trying to silence people who are dissenting from vaccines. Okay, next slide. Um, and then you're gonna have conspiracy theories. These are always the fun one. Um, there are definitely a lot of uh, very well-established uh, conspiracy theories that are being repurposed, uh, but including uh, new ones. And uh, what I have here on the right is an Instagram post from <laughs> about this woman who's saying how there's no, there's going to be a second wave of COVID because they're planning the second wave, so this idea of the pandemic, um, and if people are going to get vaccinated, that they're going to die. I'm going to say that's not true. This is all conspiracy, um, but this is definitely something uh, that has uh, continued to proliferate. Next slide. Uh, you're also going to be seeing posts around liberty and freedom. You might see this also tied in terms of like policy and legality and like whether or not you have the choice maybe to opt out of the vaccine. Um, but they, it, it tends to be framed nowadays in this idea that it's affecting your civil liberties or personal freedoms. You might have even heard the term medical freedom. Uh, this has been used in the anti-vax space, but got a lot of uh, sort of general like mainstream appeal, particularly when we talk about masks and vaccines. Um, and so talk about mandates, um, you might even have heard the term vaccine passports, whether or not you're going to have a document uh, tracking being allow you to go everywhere. Uh, and so this is definitely going to be a conversation, particularly as, you know, again, the vaccine becomes more and more um, uh, publicly available. Next slide. And then finally, we're going to see posts around morality and religion. These are not necessarily the, the greatest amount of posts, uh, but these can be one of the most um, difficult to combat because uh, it's really difficult if you're tying misinformation to someone's religious beliefs uh, of why you maybe you should get vaccinated or not. And, you know, there are actually a lot of great religious leaders out there that are helping to address this. Even the Vatican has come out and said, like, you should get the vaccine, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other people who are saying that you shouldn't. Um, and so you'll see anything if you're um, calling the vaccine maybe the mark of the beast or maybe even talking about how there's aborted fetal DNA in vaccines, so therefore my religion allows me, like, says I shouldn't get vaccinated because I think abortion is wrong. Um, so you'll have posts like you see here on the right where you can't have faith in God and still take the vaccine. Um, but if you go to the next slide, You'll also see how um, content uh, can actually have this really overlapping um, uh, nature. So the image here I have on the right is uh, a, a preacher. Um, you can see that he's got a cross on his podium here. And he's also uh, spreading conspiracy theories as well. 
So talking about how the mRNA technology is going to turn your body into like an operating system or a computer. Watch the full censored hashtag Bible prophecy update at blah, blah, blah. Um, and you're know, seeing this content getting interaction. It has uh, 1.8 thousand interactions. It's got all these shares. It's got these comments. Um, and so you see how this content is not to say like, oh, it's only going to be in the religious communities um, or it's only going to talk about religious content. No, it also can say overlap with conspiracy or um, one another. So it's not just one thing. These could often have, um, can cover them all. <laughs> Next slide. So I often get asked, like, why is vaccine misinformation so appealing? Uh, and I say ultimately, that, and this could be accurate for um, just any misinformation really, not just vaccines, but it's ultimately designed to foster this emotional response into you. Um, you know, vaccine or misinformation works by sharing it. And so we don't want to share boring articles. So if you see something like, oh, my freedoms are going to be restricted, or oh my gosh, look at all these deaths, or uh, like, oh my gosh, it might change my body into an operating system. These are all like very sort of emotionally evocative ideas. Um, and so therefore we want to share it and we just want to help people. Like if it's something that's shocking, we want to let other people know so they're more informed. Um, it can also be a lot of work to do fact checking. It's really difficult to tell what is true and not true, particularly when you think about like science and think about health. You know, most of us aren't scientists. We're not necessarily health experts. And so when we see sort of an easy explanation saying like, oh my gosh, it makes sense. It kind of connects the dots for us. Um, it can be hard to try to fact check something like that. There's also a lot of um, unknown about COVID still. There's a lot of uncertainty. Think about, you know, when I talk about that example of, like, we've had a long history with MMR. We don't necessarily have of COVID. We've only been in the pandemic for just about a year now. Um, and think, any sort of, like, crisis event uh, is prone to having misinformation spread. So if you, if you need to think about disasters, anything like from the Boston Marathon bombing to when we had a bunch of wildfires in California this past summer, misinformation could spread wildly. And we've just been in this long-term public health crisis event where we're consistently in a crisis, and so we're consistently seeing misinformation spread. There are also a lot of bad actors out there. It's not just good people who are um, accidentally sharing misinformation. I know that I've shared misinformation before, um, but there are grifters, there are people doing scans, there are people who are trying to get clicks to your site. Um, and this is not just saying that there is foreign, but there are also a lot of domestic actors here. And a lot of people within the anti-vax space um, who are really prominent are actually, you know, you at, uh, people in the U.S. Um, and we also have a preference for people to, um, for information that aligns with our views. So this is content that is, you know, um, resonates with us because we're like, oh, this is something that we kind of tend to agree with, uh, so it's going to be much more um, appealing. So next slide. Okay, so uh, one thing that I've heard <laughs> and we've talked about before is this big conversation with social media, like social media being at the root of all evil, root of all misinformation, but in reality it is a little bit more complex than that. Certainly it is a role, but I don't think it's the end all, be all role. The next slide. So um, it might feel like I'm going through this quickly because I know I'm getting towards the end of time, um, So, uh, but please feel free to read through the slides. Um, so you might have heard about this idea that algorithms can create echo chambers to show content that's more and more in stream. Um, and in a sense that, you know, if you find some of this uh, anti-vax information or any misinformation more um, a little interesting and you try to engage with that, they're, they're going to want to show you more of that content. Um, you know, platforms ultimately are not designed for civic debate. They're not meant to be like the sort of like factual information tools. They're meant to like keep you on the platform. There is much more money to, um, to your value uh, in staying on the platform, interacting with content, getting those engagements, um, and that's going to happen by having misinformation on your platform. So I think ultimately a lot of these platforms don't necessarily have a lot of motivation uh, to fix the issue. Um, and there's been plenty of like exposés with Facebook um, about that. Um, so. Each platform has their own strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, like, and there's certain affordances of how they're handling misinformation. But ultimately, they're meant to connect people with information and with other people, not necessarily be a tool designed to show only good information. Next slide. Um, in addition, uh, more so in the past uh, couple. Um, decade or so, the speed and accessibility of information is absolutely instant. I can create, I'm here in, in Seattle, Washington, I can create a bit of misinformation, and this can spread worldwide instantaneously. That is not the way we thought about information, if you think about in the history of information. Uh, so this is a, in, the, in terms of that, a relatively new phenomenon um, over the past couple of decades. Um, and particularly, you can reach different demographics and different communities uh, more so than before. 
you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, vaccine misinformation, if you wanted to find it, you really had to go to, like, anti-vaccine circles, anti-vaccine, like, Facebook groups, um, message boards. But really, now we can find this everywhere. And in the sense that we're talking about vaccines everywhere, I can go to like a local dog group and can find anti-vax content there because people are talking about COVID. I, I can't go a single day without hearing anything, something about COVID or vaccines. And so people are just naturally getting exposed. Um, and in addition to that, we're seeing stronger ties now um, and it's overlap with other communities. This can include like anything from conspiracy, conspiracy communities like QAnon to anti-lockdown communities, but a, a number of different areas. So the ways in which um, anti-vaccination information is spreading online is not just located to this like one little sort of niche fringe area. It is quite literally you can go almost anywhere and find it. In particular, you know, we could talk about each um, platform, but Facebook groups um, are particularly dangerous when it comes to uh, vaccine misinformation. You know, um, I have often told people like this idea of people have come to the groups for the information, they're trying to find it, um, but they end up staying for the community. You know, uh, people who I, I've interviewed over the years um, often tell me how their needs were not met. Um, as far as like their information needs through their health care provider or through just regular searching online, and they had to go to these community spaces. They often feeling dismissed um, by their health care providers or their friends or family for bringing up these concerns, but this new community of people um, often welcomes them in uh, and say like, yes, come. If you have questions, come here. We'll help and give you all the information you could ever need. Okay, next slide. So social media platforms um, have been taking more and more measures over the years addressing this issue of vaccine misinformation. Um, and the, over the past year, a number of the platforms have even updated to be very COVID specific of what is not allowed on their platform. Um, while these will vary in comprehensiveness, enforcement I think ultimately is the uh, the the answer here because not all are enforced equally. Um, Pinterest, who doesn't necessarily have a very comprehensive, they're very like we just don't allow it. They just don't allow it. They're the best. <laughs> you may not have thought of it, but Pinterest is absolutely the best. Just, you do, they do not allow any vaccine misinformation on their platform. They only accept um, information from like internationally recognized health organizations. Conversely, Facebook has a very long, extensive COVID vaccine policy about like what isn't allowed, but I can still go on the platform today. I can still find it. I can still go there right now and find it for you. And so, interestingly, because users are constantly developing new ways to navigate around moderation, um, which some people decide to call censorship. Anything that kind of feels like your voice is being silenced is going to feel like censorship. And so, any way you try to like develop, like, oh, we're going to we're going to remove this, we're going to remove this, you're going to people will find ways to work around it. Once you have like a strong enforcement policy, people will find ways to get around it. Um, and we're seeing the effects of that. So, you know, the term medical freedom um, is being used a lot more now to get around the term of using anti-vaccine because anti-vaccine is being moderated. Um, and this idea of like deplatforming. Um, deplatforming can absolutely work. I am more worried about these major platforms where there are more people than there are like these little fringe platforms. Um, but multiple platforms need to work together. It, it can't just be one. So uh, for example, Robert F. Kennedy recently got his um, Instagram profile taken down, um, but his Facebook profile is still up. <laughs> we know he's a repeat offender. So uh, Facebook, who owns both those companies, uh, only removed it on there, and he, they still leave his organization up on both platforms. Um, and this needs to be both for like fringe accounts, um, but also notably people who are repeat offenders. So you know someone who is consistently sharing vaccine misinformation. They do it over and over again. Um, and you fail to take action on the account. They, they did finally on one platform, but he's still on all the other ones. So how much censorship is really happening, right? All right, next slide. Um, in particular, this could be really this idea of like misinformation via science. You know, you're going to see antidotes, you're going to see all this sort of stuff, but what's really difficult to find um, is this idea that, you know, misinformation can come, make it look very scientific. You can use graphs, you can, you're going to have people who, um, there's this idea of like armchair epidemiologists you'll see around COVID um, and vaccines, um, people who are false experts and maybe don't have their background in virology or their background in vaccines, um, who are saying like, oh, I'm this expert and I have a doctor title um, and therefore I'm an expert. But it, it, that's really tricky. Like how do you say like, well, just because you're a doctor does not make you an expert? Like how do I tell you that just because I, I have a degree that I am an expert in what I'm saying? And, and that's a hard thing to do. 
Um, and it's got to be one of the hardest things to address. But uh, the one thing I always tell people and my colleagues is, you know, because we do see a number of professionals in the space and they can manipulate graphs, they can talk things in a very scientific way that makes it easy for the public to um, absorb that and believe it, is that um, science is, is about consensus, not about the rogue scientists. Everything I'm saying here today, it, it can be repeated by many other people within my field and my specialty. I am not saying anything here that should be shocking, that should be um, sort of unusual to anyone in my, um, in my field, and I think that's the idea. It's about consensus. It's not about the rogue scientists. So um, when we go through fact checking, which I'm going to go to, and I'm sorry, I'm going to like rush right through it. Um, but uh, it, it's not about like, oh, here's the one source. What are the most people saying? So next slide. Um, and ultimately, this is this is more than just about social media. I, I know that I want typically focus on social media and social networking platforms. I will always be harsh to them. That is my whole thing. Um, but they're not the only contributor to the issue of vaccine misinformation. So um, even mainstream media and journalists, even veteran journalists, can have really poor science communication. Uh, in particular, right now, we have a lot of journalists who are new to the vaccine beat, new to the disinfo beat, and they don't necessarily always have the best practices built up. And so we see <laughs> I think this terrible case is happening just because you need more people covering it, and they don't know necessarily how to cover um, you know, anti-vaccination topics. So this uh, image I have here on the right about anti-vaccination groups targeting local media, you know, um, there's plenty of cases within like a local news source interviewing someone who then just like spouts a bunch of anti-vaccine nonsense and they don't really provide a correction. And then that image, like that goes out. So your local news media can also be spreading <laughs> misinformation. Um, and really ultimately anyone can contribute to misinformation spread. Um, and they're not always things that are always tied to use. Some things are really difficult to debunk. So. Um, like this idea of like friend of a friend, like oh, like my mom, sister's cousin's husband's coworker had this happen to them, and now I'm telling you this. All right, next slide. So what do we do here? Um, I'm going to unfortunately breathe a little bit through this because I know we're just about at time and we started late, so I apologize. Um, but if we go to the next slide. You know, ultimately, uh, everyone can play this really pivotal role in correcting misinformation. If one out of three people uh, are having some sort of vaccine hesitancy that they're not sure they're going to get the vaccine, we all know someone who has that hesitation. So um, anyone can play a role in helping trying to correct misinformation or helping address that ex um, that uh, hesitancy. Um, people who I I've talked to who are really anti-vaccines are really far in the spectrum, tend to really, really ignored and not listened to. So we want to really address that before people go way far down off the spectrum and, and listen to the concerns. You know, I always say that people are not dumb, they're not stupid for vaccine hesitant. The fact that it is a completely normal reaction that most people are feeling nowadays. Even I myself occasionally feel like, oh man, I'm seeing all this content all day. Even I have my own hesitation. Um, and ultimately, this is not an easy thing. You know, I, I think it's very unsatisfying when I tell people, like, there's no easy solution. If there was, we probably wouldn't be <laughs> in this case. It's like, it is a very complex thing. People um, don't necessarily become vaccine hesitant just because of one piece of misinformation. And they're not necessarily become pro-vaccine with one piece either. Um, in addition, you know, because it's something that's being so highly reported, we're seeing consistently, um, you know, we're building up this heuristic bias that there might be unsafe, there's all these concerns, there's all this worry. Um, even if these are very few and far between, um, it, it's, you know, it's going to be difficult to have to address all that hesitancy. Um, so all I can say is if you do have someone um, it, uh, that you deal with or you interact with that has this, it's, you can try to debunk misinformation with them. Um, and then I kind of go through um, the next few slides, a SIFT method here, uh, which is uh, stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, and then trace claims and quotes. Um, and so we go to the next slide, stop. If you see it, misinformation potentially, even if you decide just to not share it, that's great. As I said before, uh, misinformation gets its power by sharing it. Even if you're not sharing it more, uh, that is fantastic already there. Go to the next slide. Um, next thing you can do can investigate the source here. Um, so who is sharing this information? Is this a reputable news organization? Is this actually from the legitimate one, you know, like that fake imposter content? Uh, you can use Google to Wikipedia to look at the source you may not know. Um, this is some, like this is always the next step. Um, next slide. Um, find better coverage. So look up what other people and other news organizations or other outlets are saying on that um, 
event, you know, is this idea again of that consensus, is it the one rogue or is it like what everyone is saying? I uh, use fact checking sites. Um, Reuters does a lot of actual debunking on vaccine misinformation that starts getting viral and they do all that fact checking. You can even do something like reverse image searching, so that false context and connection that I mentioned before as a tactic, they'll use their old image and reuse it again. Try that. Use that. Um, and finally, on the next slide, um, tracing claims and quotes and media to the original content. So um, you can click through the link, find out what study or where they're actually coming this from. Um, if you remember that CNN quote example, I went and like used Google to find where does this actual quote from and look at the entire context so you're not decontextualized. But even after you go through this whole process, if you're still not sure, you don't have to share. <laughs> It can take a while, particularly when we think about breaking news, to get a lot of fact checking happening. So it might just take a moment um, to get that, uh, to find information. Just pause and then come back to it later. Um, and finally, as I, as I try to like end the talk today on the next slide, um, vaccine misinformation is bigger than just social media. It's certainly a huge part of it. It's the way that we connect and find it. I think Facebook groups has been a major contributor to this, but it's definitely not the whole part. It is a complex, multifaceted issue. It can't just be solved with just like one easy solution. There is no golden ticket on this. And then we didn't even talk about this today, but there are much larger societal factors. Um, so you think about like trust in pharmaceutical companies, particularly we think about we just kind of going through the opioid crisis, or trust in the medical system. Um, particularly we talk about this for communities of color who have a long historical and modern day sort of lots of reasons why we shouldn't trust the medical system. Um, and, and ultimately, like if there's one big takeaway, <laughs> one big takeaway if you didn't pay attention anything else uh, that I talked to today, um, take away that like vaccine misinformation or vaccine hesitancy, it's not just an information issue. And I tell you this because I read vaccine information literally every single day in my life, and I have for the past six, seven years, and I still, I'm planning to go get vaccinated. And it's far more than that. Um, and it's a complicated issue. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, you know, I don't think vaccine hesitancy or the anti-vax movement is going away anytime soon. Uh, but I do think now more than ever, it is a really critical time to address vaccine hesitancy. So just like climate scientists have been advocating for action to help save the planet, I want to advocate that we need to take action on a national level to address the issue of this misinformation and vaccine hesitancy and this much larger conversation of how we both trust and understand science. So, because ultimately the thing is, if I had the power to say remove like every social media platform from existence, I had the button um, to do it, we would still have this issue of vaccine hesitancy. It's, it is a difficult problem, but it's not an impossible problem. Uh, thank you. And then next slide is a, just my thank you slide. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Koltai, for that true whirlwind uh, through the <laughs> wonderful world of social media misinformation. This is, I feel like we definitely gave you a, a challenge to <laughs> give us a <laughs> overview of a very complex topic within the limited time. So thank you so much. And I'm sure um, folks also appreciate uh, the great information you shared with us today. So now um, we have about 15 minutes to kind of go through some quick Q&A. And um, I'm looking through the chat here. I've been keeping an eye on the chat dur during your um, talk, and it looks like there, there were several comments basically giving examples of exactly the different types of misinformation um, you reviewed, Dr. Koltai. So there was you know, an example of someone, uh, one commenter said, I had a conversation with a man whose vaccine hesitancy was based on his belief that the coronavirus was created by the same companies that come up with the vaccines. How else could they have created them so rapidly? So I think that also kind of speaks to this, um, how people are, you know, trying to use critical thinking skills to understand the vaccines but are coming up with, with different conclusions from, from what, you know, uh, the science and, and scientific consensus might might come come to. Um, someone else mentioned how the a, a commenter says my best my best friend's father-in-law got Bell's palsy after the vaccine, and the doctor told them it was caused by the vaccine. Um, and so you kind of touched upon this too about how sometimes health professionals are very tricky if they're spreading health misinformation. It's kind of hard to address. Um, so I was wondering if you could share any examples of thoughts in which you've heard of strategies on how to address misinformation, particularly within the health professional field, particularly as we, um, you know, many folks are very interested, are concerned about medical mistrust and, you know, how do we build trust so that, um, you know, folks can actually, you know, believe what they're, or, you know, trust what their medical 
uh, doctors are telling them to do as opposed to thinking that there's some type of maleficence going on in the background. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. That, that, is, that is a large question, and so I'll do my best to answer it in a short amount of time because I could easily, we could easily talk about this for hours. Um, and uh, back in the day when happy hours in person were a thing, I would easily talk all my friends' ears off about this. <laughs> so um, the first thing I would say is that, you know, um, I don't want to, I'm not going to say here that the vaccine is 100% safe. In the sense that I don't think anything is 100% safe. And I think, you know, if you're trying to think about, you know, vaccines and saying that, you know, you should absolutely take it. Everyone has to take it, this and this. And I think that's very, like, sort of, like, uh, taking a, a, a hammer to maybe, um, you know, that doesn't, something that doesn't need to be hammered. And I think, you know, there's how you have a conversation one-on-one -on -one is how you, different than how you have a conversation to a public. Because, you know, in a sense that even condoms are never 100%, right? But we still recommend condoms. <laughs> to do its job. Um, even a seatbelt is not 100%. It's still, we still recommend people to wear seatbelts. Nothing is 100%. And so um, the, the cases that we do see, um, there are ones that we can say, absolutely, this was a side effect. This happened because of the vaccine. And it's absolutely terrible. Like, I, I don't want to ever say that someone's um, actual vaccine injury or story that happened um, is not legitimate. It's not valid. Those are people who are going through very real things. Um, and I think ultimately, if you're too, if you don't want to take the risk of it, I am not going to force you to get the vaccine. And that is ultimately your own personal choice about that, right, whether or not you decide to do so or not. Um, one thing I can just overwhelmingly still say is that we've vaccinated millions and millions and millions of people here. And so the cases that we are seeing that are uh, legitimate side effects in the vaccines, uh, either from Bell's palsy, um, you know, or in some cases of like shaking or tremors and things like that, or people just generally feeling unwell, um, are still uh, minimal compared to the amount of people who haven't had any of these sort of side effects. So the other issue of, you know, people within healthcare misinformation. So one thing I think this actually really highlights that it is not an education issue, right? Um, some people are like, oh, you know, people who are have actually has been, they're so dumb, they're not educated. And so I'm like, no, they're not. It's, it's not the case. And so, you know, we see, uh, particularly if you look at, there's a lot of actually like nurse and healthcare groups um, that have uh, misinformation that's particularly targeted to those groups. Um, there's a organization called America's Frontline Doctors that actually uh, creates like white paper reports that are being disseminated and spread amongst, um, they, they're publicly available on their websites, but also being spread on in very sort of like non-public ways through like email chains and then that somehow they get forwarded over to me. And so there's a lot of different ways that um, misinformation can be targeted towards different communities or things that are particularly relevant to that community and information misinformation can be targeted to people in the healthcare field. And so you know, and it's not to say anything about like a lack of critical thinking. We do have critical thinking skills, but I think it's even going beyond the type of critical thinking that we've understand it here. Um, and you know, the way the way that I can think about this again, if we, and I, I we don't have a perfect solution. Of how do you take someone who's within the healthcare field and make them not <laughs> they mis, you know vaccine misinformed potentially? Is is this long process? Think about like it's not just a bit of the information itself. It's like why. Why does this misinformation potentially resonate with them? You know, um, and COVID is particularly tricky because it's different than we've thought about in the way that of childhood vaccinations because everyone's making that decision for themselves. And so, is it? Are you worried because you think that you know, is COVID the risk or is the vaccine the risk? Are you worried because of larger conspiratorial thing like who is making the vaccine? Like, what? What? Get really at that element of like what is that hesitation it, there's the information element but I think that's the deeper sort of like large concern like do you just it, it could be something as, as a bigger issue of like do you not trust pharmaceutical companies and that's something you can't really address and so <laughs> like on, on a like a single conversation right because that's something outside of our power and so I don't have a great answer to that <laughs> ultimately what I'm saying is that you know, you could talk and have this conversation, make, you know, try to see what sources people can agree on. You know, do you, that they don't trust the CDC, they don't trust the government, they don't trust, don't trust any of that, then you're like, well, that's a bigger issue. But they're like, no, I do trust the government or I do trust this element. And you can kind of come to like, what is sort of that middle ground? What are sources that you can agree upon? And then you go and build from there. And that's ultimately, because if you cannot even agree on the same sources, then you may not be the right person to um, try to like have that conversation. But I think ultimately we, most people can find some sources that are like, yes, this is a trustworthy source. Okay, so let's build from there. What are these trustworthy sources saying? And how, try to have that delicate, nuanced conversation.
Great, thank you. This next question actually also relates to that in terms of how to respond to perhaps misinformation. Um, one of the attendees asks, when we respond to someone's incorrect or misleading social media posts, who is the focus? Should, they be should we be f focusing on the individual who posted it or the other people who might be reading the original post? So perhaps how do you present that information in response to misleading information? Mm, I think it depends whether or not this is like a random person that you're interacting with or someone that's like someone you know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if it's someone that you have like no relationship with or co totally random person, um, then I'm going to say your odds of like trying to convince that person are probably pretty low. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, you can, when we talk about like trying to correct someone online, um, and I think there was actually this, uh, y'all had a wonderful talk by uh, Leticia Bode, Bode, B-O-D-E, who does a lot of work on correcting um, health misinformation. Um, but I think like particularly if you can leverage some sort of personal, if it's someone you personally know, uh, you're trying to try to talk to that conversation, that person about it. Uh, if it's sort of, if you want to just try to provide a correction because you don't know the person and you're like, other people are reading this, say it's like Twitter, then that's fine. Uh, but no, ultimately, that may be a really difficult thing to try to just generally correct people. It's always good to kind of share that information um, out there um, and provide it from a trustworthy source, an easy-to-read source. Providing easy-to-read infographics are always great. Um, but I think, like, I think you have the most power, particularly with people who are in your network who are going to listen to you and engage with you on it. Uh, I don't know if people necessarily like getting into, like, sort of uh, internet fights uh, with people they don't know, um, but they generally don't have a long-lasting power in correcting misinformation, but people who are maybe reading it uh, are seeing that, like, oh, here is the alternative explanation. They're seeing a correction with it, and I do think that is incredibly valuable versus just seeing the misinformation. Great. Thank you. Um, just in recognition of time, I know we have about six minutes left, um, and before we hop back to Q&A, I'm just going to quickly post in the chat the link to the MLA and CHES CE evaluation link. So for those of you that are interested in receiving um, continuing education credit for attending today's webinar, you can follow that link here. And Margie has also provided, oh, I think I'm going to send it one more time. There's also a link in the chat for um, where the recording and slides from today's webinar will also be posted at a later date. So just wanted to put that there in case folks need to hop off to attend their next meeting or webinar or anything like that. Um, so thanks for that aside. Going to hop back to the questions. Um, so let's see. Oh. So one question asks, what best practices or research can you refer for how specifically BIPOC or black indigenous people of color communities respond to social media messaging to adopt vaccines? So talking about a specific audience. Mm. Yeah, this is something, um, it's always, uh, okay, so it, it's just, so the way we think about um, BIPOC communities, particularly talk about um, vaccine misinformation is, I'm not going to say that I am like the best expert on it, um, even though I myself am uh, a woman of color, <laughs> uh, something I thought about a long time, um, but I actually refer to a lot of other experts or experts in this area who research this specific thing. And the, to quickly sum up their life bodies work is one thing that's really important to note is that when you think about sort of mistrust within um, medical system. It's, you know, a lot of people talk about like, oh, it's this geeky or, oh, it's all these like infamous, you know, cases of say, like the long history of like persecution against indigenous people and native people here in the US. Um, and I'm like, there's absolutely historical context, absolutely. But there's also like still today. <laughs> there is um, recently this really powerful story at, uh, that was end of last year uh, about, uh, you know, this black woman who is a physician, doctor, and her own, experience going through the medical system because she was diagnosed with COVID and her physician was ignoring her symptoms. It's like ignoring her descriptions of pain and she felt like she was being very dismissed and later passed away from COVID. And so when people, when BIPOC communities have distrust or mistrust of sort of medical institutions, you know, I don't think it's completely like unwarranted based on on their life experiences. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of skills we could do to try to help continue to advocate uh, to get better at, you know, improving the medical system for, for BIPOC uh, people. And so uh, particularly thinking about then uh, knowing this is that the unfortunate thing is a lot of anti-vaccine activists tend to try to 
uh, I think, co-opt those injustices of, you know, the BIPOC experiences. And so, you know, one thing I'll, I'll constantly see uh, within sort of anti-vax communities, and particular activists, is they're using say, anything from the Holocaust to Tuskegee, a case of Henrietta Lacks, uh, a variety of different things, um, even uh, this, like, CDC whistleblower study um, that's, you know, claimed that, uh, you know, potentially black boys suffered higher rates of autism from vaccines than, say, white boys, and constantly using um, the evidence of, you know, black and brown bodies in pain. And so uh, I think there is messaging that is both kind of potentially being targeted towards BIPOC communities, but also messaging um, that, it, you know, also talks to people like, oh, you know, no one wants to be called racist, and so it's like also addressing sort of like woke white Americans. It's like, oh, you are actually being not racist by saying that you're advocating that you know, say that black people should not get vaccines. And so it it, it could be a tricky thing. So I think if you um, are trying to improve vaccine um, uptake within communities of color, I think absolutely you're going to need people who are um, key figures within that community, people who are trusted in those spaces to help kind of promote that. And I think this is more than just saying like oh, a social media campaign. I think that's a lot of things that people tend to do, like, oh, look at all, you know, and it could feel very performative, like, oh, look at this person of color who's getting vaccinated. And it's more, it's more about that. It's more about actually about that conversation and really addressing like, you know, from people who look like you, who under have the same cultural competency as you. Um, to address those concerns. And, and I think what we've seen in some communities is that, you know, a lot of communities of color have been suffering higher rates of death of COVID than, um, say, white communities. And, you know, I particularly think about, like, Native peoples here in, in the U.S. is that we've seen, you know, the loss of a lot of elders. And so we've actually seen high, in some indigenous communities, not all, but some indigenous communities have actually seen pretty high rates of vaccination uptake, some better rates than we've seen in the country. Um, because they realize the value in preventing that loss of life because they've had so much loss. And I think, if you think about that, the risk of death, particularly of like loved members or community, or maybe potentially the risk of like a temporary side effect, uh, like what is going to be that bigger risk? And I think, you know, it's never anything this idea of that we need to be pushed. It's about having a conversation. And so um, to answer that question about best practices or, or about how to deal with it, I would say, you know, there are, um, I can, after the talk, I can, I can share, like, sort of a list of names of people who are, like, the best at talking about this. Um, but I think, you know, understanding that this is something that is a long societal issue and it's not going to be solved overnight. And you need to really be able to work with these communities and people who are um, central figures in this community to really promote, um, you know, when is the best decision to vaccinate. Great. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully, you know, today's session is a continuation of that larger conversation. Um, it's important to talk about these topics. So we really appreciate you taking the time today, Dr. Koltai, to speak and um, to share your expertise and your knowledge and recommendations with us.